Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar from Wu Yu on amniotic membranes and their uses in optometry. And tonight we have the queen herself, Dr. Stephanie Wu. So nice to have you and so nice to be here. I'm your host, Dr. Elise Kramer. So Dr. Stephanie Wu does not need an introduction. We all know who she is, but it is my honor to introduce her tonight. Dr. Stephanie Wu graduated from the Southern California College of Optometry. She completed a cornea and contact lens residency at University of Missouri, St. Louis. Dr. Wu is a past president of the Scleral Lens Education Society, a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society. Dr. Wu is an adjunct professor at Midwestern University and enjoys lecturing around the world on the subject of contact lenses and anterior segment ocular disease. She was the recipient of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute Practitioner of the Year in 2022 and was awarded Nevada Optometric Association's Educator of the Year Award in 2020. Dr. Wu owns the Contact Lens Institute of Nevada, a clinic dedicated entirely to custom contact lenses. Dr. Wu is the founder and CEO of Wu University. So without further ado, I will let you take it away. And I'm really looking forward to learning from you tonight. Oh, thanks, Dr. Kramer, for the kind intro. And yeah, it's weird being on the other end as the uh, the speaker. I think this is my first lecture of this year for, for Wu Yu, if you can believe it. So yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Kramer. All right, so here's my financial disclosures all of which been mitigated. And tonight we're gonna be talking about amniotic membrane uses in optometry. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Stephanie Wu. I own a practice in Las Vegas, Nevada. So today, what we want to do is go over amniotic membranes. And my goal for you at the end of this course is to feel comfortable using amniotic membranes, or if you're not going to use amniotic membranes, at least knowing kind of that they exist, knowing what they're used for. And if you maybe have a patient that you think could benefit, maybe sending them to another optometrist or ophthalmologist that, that uses them. So I really just want you to uh, just take away the fact that amniotic membranes exist. They're really helpful for so many patients. And hopefully you get something out of this lecture regarding amniotic membranes. So at the end of the session, hopefully you'll be able to identify three good candidates for amniotic membranes, describe two differences between dehydrated and the wet tissue, explain two diagnoses that might benefit from amniotic membranes and properly bill and code for amniotic membranes. So how did I get started with amniotic membranes? Because this really wasn't like super, like I don't remember in optometry school, like even learning about it. Maybe there was one second of one lecture, but I kind of didn't even know this existed. And in 2014, imagine you're in clinic and your patient shows up with this. So immediately, hopefully, a lot of you guys are like, oh, my God, what is that? Um, yeah. And I have the same question. So this patient, she actually started out with a very small peripheral ulcer and I'm sure a lot of you on here have dealt with corneal ulcers before, especially with contact lens wearers. And it just looked like a peripheral ulcer. She was a contact lens wearer. Great, we're gonna start her on some antibiotics. And then the, the next day she came in for follow-up and another doctor saw her. So I saw her first. And the next doctor saw her and he messaged me and he said, hey, can you tell me like what this ulcer looked like? And I said, yeah, it was about maybe a millimeter. It was round, had defined borders. I just put her on some, um, I think I put her on a fluoroquinolone. And he said, well, that it's weird because it's like three millimeters today. So it like doubled in size, basically. So he tried something else. I can't remember what he put her on. And then we saw her back the next day and the ulcer was getting bigger. 
So this patient, now we're like panicking because we're like, oh my gosh, like this patient's ulcer is getting larger and it's like not responding to antibiotics. So over the course of like two weeks, the, there's three doctors in our clinic. This was a patient that was at a very rural location. So we kind of rotated seeing patients there. We tried, uh, so we cultured it, um, sent it out. But of course, if you culture in your office, you know, it's not immediate. So you have to start doing something. So we cultured it to try to test, see what's going on. Is it fungus? What's, what's happening here? But we tried all sorts of stuff. We tried antibiotics. We tried antivirals. We tried steroids. Um, we tried oral antibiotics, oral steroids, um, oral antivirals. We tried natamycin. We tried um, things for acanthamoeba. We tried everything. And it ended up looking like this. And we could not get this thing under control. Now, I was in a very rural location about two and a half hours away from a major city. And this patient did not want to travel to uh, a large city. So and, and if you practice in a rural area, you know what I'm talking about. You have these patients that refuse to travel or don't have the means to travel or the funds or whatever the situation is. So we have to just do our best to help these people. So that is what got me interested in amniotic membranes is I started talking to a lot of colleagues that are corneal specialists and people that have seen some weird stuff. And they were kind of giving me some treatment options to try. But because we could not get this under control, that's when we kind of started investigating what an amniotic membrane might do for this patient. So we're going to launch our first poll. So Jenna, if you can launch that, I want to ask you guys what you think this is, bacteria, fungus, amoeba, or corneal plaque? Uh, so Jenna, I'm sorry, this is not the right poll. Great. So this is the correct poll. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, so what condition is seen in this image? Is it a bacteria? Is it a virus? Is it a fungus? Is it some sort of amoeba or corneal plaque? And remember, you know, we've cultured it. We've tried antibiotics. We've tried antivirals. We've tried antifungals. We've tried um, the things for acanthamoeba. You know, we've tried like so many different things. Um, so what do we what do we think? All right, Jenna, if you would mind sharing the results. Okay, so we've got a variety of things. It seems like most people, I guess it's kind of split between fungus, amoeba, and corneal plaque um, as far as those three. So we're going to kind of continue talking about that case. Okay, so what I'm telling you is that we tried all these things, nothing worked, and then somebody suggested an amniotic membrane. So I had to call my rep who I didn't know. I had to like research this company and find out who my rep even was. And then he drove to my clinic the next day to show me how to use an amniotic membrane. Um, in this case, we used, we used something called a Procara and we left that on the next day. She basically, the whole membrane had um, disintegrated or, you know, got, uh, thinned out. So we had to put a new one on and we repeated that for a few days until we ended up with the final end result, which you see here. So in the end, 
the amniotic membrane was the only thing that ended up doing anything for this rare corneal condition that none of us doctors could get under control. And it ended up, you won't believe it, this was herpes. And I know a lot of you have seen herpes, and this absolutely does not look like herpes to me at all. And I would have never known. And it wasn't even responding. We tried Veroptic. We tried acyclovir oral and nothing was working. So this is just one of those weird things where you tested for all this stuff. You, you got them on the right treatment plan, you think. And in some cases, uh, it's just a weird thing. And you just kind of have to use, use it as a last ditch effort. But this is why it got so into amniotic membranes was because of this special case. Um, and to date, I have fit probably over 600 patients with amniotic membranes for a variety of conditions. So quickly, let's just go over what an amniotic membrane is. It is derived from a placenta, and the amniotic membrane is the innermost layer of the fetal membranes. It's got three layers. It has an epithelium, a basement membrane, and the stroma, and that further goes into three more layers, which is the inner compact layer, the middle fibroblast layer, and the outermost spongy layer. So the amnion, as you can see in this photo, it's covering and it's the closest part to the baby. And then this amniotic sac forms, which is filled with amniotic fluid. And this is a this is used to create a protective um, and a nutritional environment for the baby. So this really protects the baby as it's growing in the mother. And how did amniotic membranes become a thing? So the history of amniotic membranes is, is actually very well studied for a variety of conditions. But in the early 20th century, they found out that it was really good for wound healing and reconstructive purposes. The mechanism of action is still poorly understood. There's a lot of research papers and articles that think they know kind of why things work. Uh, growth factors, heavy chain hyaluronic acid, cytokines. There's a lot of different things in amniotic membranes and stem cells that we think help with wound healing. It also really helps with wound closure and reduces scar formation. And I think as eye doctors, that's really important because we're always so scared of scarring and we want to prevent the cornea, the beautiful, clear cornea from scarring. And so anything we can do to help prevent that or make it as minimal as possible, I think is always good practice. Another unique thing is that amniotic membranes lack immunologic markers, meaning that because it's a stem cell, you're very uh, less likely to uh, respond to it or have some sort of um, rejection or allergic response. So that's why amniotic membranes, you know, they can kind of be used no matter what blood type you have, what tissue type you have with, with rare exceptions to some, you know, crazy diseases. But with amniotic membranes, because they're these stem cells, it's very unlikely that the patient is going to have a reaction. Not saying that that hasn't happened, but it is very rare. Amniotic membranes are, are widely used for patients that have chemical burns and patients that are in like burn units. If you've ever been in a hospital or worked in a hospital or been in a burn unit, they actually use these very, very large sheets of amniotic membranes to help protect where the skin would be that's completely exposed to the environment. It's also used to reconstruct different areas within the body. So when you're doing surgery on the internal organs, sometimes surgeons want to prevent tissue from adhering to each other or from organs from adhering to each other. So they'll kind of stuff some of the amniotic membrane tissue in between where the surgery has happened, and that way we can prevent adhesion. So I always tell people, like for some reason, I always end up giving this lecture like right after breakfast or lunch, and then for everybody right now, it's probably like 
right after dinner or you're eating dinner right now. So uh, if you get queasy, be aware of the next few images that we'll be going through because they are pretty disgusting. So this is a picture, I think this is fascinating. Diabetic foot ulcers. There's so many patients that have diabetes and all, as you guys know, the stats just keep increasing, more and more people become diabetic. And what they develop is this neuropathy in their feet where they can't feel anything and there's very poor circulation. So a lot of risk factors for diabetics are these foot ulcers. So in the top left, you can see that that foot ulcer is very large. Um, it's open, it's gaping. In the top right where that little white stuff is, is they're packing in some of these amniotic membrane stem cells. So they're pushing that in. And the bottom left, they're covering it with a breathable adhesive. And then you can see the bottom right image. I believe that is like 12 weeks later, if my memory serves. But so about three months later, you go from that top image to the bottom image. And I think that that is a huge improvement um, compared to maybe some other treatment options that this person may have gone through. Okay, so more gross feet pictures. This is a case report from a podiatrist. I am not super familiar with feet, but I think this gets the point across of the power of amniotic membranes. So again, we're talking to, about a diabetic patient that has a foot wound. And on the left, uh, foot, you can see that giant ulcer. It's open. It looks horrible. This ulcer had been there for five years. And again, I don't know podiatry very well, but they, the doctor did serial debridement, wound vac, and allografts over this five-year period, but she could not get this ulcer under control or to heal. It just was this thing that just was there for five years. And then now the right foot is also starting to develop an ulcer. So here's that same ulcer, the dimensions, it was about one centimeter wide by two centimeters in length and five millimeters in depth. And you can see you've got this very hard, almost keratinized uh, tissue that's surrounding that foot ulcer. It looks very unhealthy. It's definitely not getting a blood supply. It just looks really gross, right? So this is after two weeks, after using an amniotic membrane, so stuffing it kind of like that first photo I showed you and applying um, an adhesive that's breathable. And you can see after a two week period, there's already a major improvement. That keratinized area um, is, is a lot better and we've got kind of that fresh blood flow. So you can see it's a lot more red. So more blood is kind of coming to the surface there. And then this is after four weeks. I think this is a tremendous improvement um, about a month later from going from this gigantic yucky ulcer that has not healed for five years. And four weeks later, after amniotic membranes, we've got this kind of small ulcer that we're dealing with. So you can see that there's such a dramatic change in, in the wound itself and the tissue around it. And that, that's living tissue. And here you can see what happens, you know, after, uh, you know, three months. So this is just kind of demonstrates the power of amniotic membranes where this podiatrist had tried all of these conventional treatments for this foot at, and for five years and could not get this thing under control. And after only a two, three months, I mean, this foot is basically back to normal. So the next poll, Jenna, is do you currently use amniotic membranes, yes or no? I always love doing this poll because when I first used to give this lecture back in like 2014, 2015, like almost no one had even heard of amniotic membranes. Um, and it's like over the years, it's, it's fun to just kind of see like how many people use them. And I always still like to see how many people do not use them. That's always really interesting information. All right, Jenna, let's see what we got. Oh, interesting. Okay, so about 27% 
use amniotic membranes and 73% do not. Thank you. That's that's interesting information. Well, I hope you learned something today about amniotic membranes for those who don't use them. So I just want to do a quick overview of where do amniotic membranes come from? So they are derived from placentas, from mothers that are undergoing a C-section. Now, these are planned C-sections. These are ones that the doctor determines that the mother and the baby are going to be healthy. Um, they go through a screening process and they go through this whole donation process. So these are planned C-sections. Um, these are not used when like there's an emergency when they need to do a C-section, which is a lot of births. Uh, these are all planned. So the mom and the, and the baby are kind of, you know, less stressed and kind of like in a predicted environment. These are really screened for communicable diseases like HIV, syphilis, you know, other viruses, things like that. So they're very highly screened. And they're so highly screened that the what happens is the mother is tested many times during the pregnancy to make sure that she doesn't have any of the diseases and then doesn't contract any diseases while she's pregnant. Then when she delivers the baby, um, a sample of that tissue is tested right away and the mother is also tested again. Then when they take that tissue and they transport it to the lab or the processing facility, they test it again. And then after this whole thing is done, they test it again, at the end of processing all of these. And they have to keep a portion of it to keep retesting for months and years to come, just in case something comes back. They also test the mother like three months later as well, just to make sure nothing pops up on her end as far as diseases go. So these are very, very screened for these diseases. So properties of amniotic membranes, I think this is important, not only in healthcare, but eye care, that all of these apply to us as eye doctors. Anti-inflammatory, all of the research in the last you know, decade or more is showing that inflammation is a huge cause of all sorts of eye problems. So anything we can do to keep down the inflammation is good. It's all, they're also anti-fibrotic, so it helps to prevent scar tissue. And I think for me in my practice, that was always the most important thing, or one of the most important things is helping to prevent the scar from forming on the cornea or at least limiting the scar that would form. They're also anti-angiogenic, which means it helps to prevent new blood vessels from growing, like neovascularization, which we always hate to see. Amniotic membranes also have antimicrobial properties. So kind of looking at that first case that I showed you, who knows why this amniotic membrane worked? when all of my other drugs and things did not work. Um, you know, it's just the power of some of these stem cells. Amniotic membranes, they also promote epithelialization. And so somebody that maybe would not re-epithelialize for let's say seven days for some procedure they had or some, some issue that's going on with their cornea, they might heal now in like two or three days. So it kind of expedites that healing process and helps to promote those epithelial cells to grow. Amniotic membranes are a pro-healing thing. So what I mean by that is if you were to treat a corneal ulcer with um, your typical treatments, let's just say it's a bacteria, so you're treating with antibacterials, um, then that, that is an active approach. With the scar, you're kind of waiting for the re-epithelialization to occur before you're adding on a steroid for the most part. Um, of course, everybody practices a bit differently, but when you use an amniotic membrane kind of earlier on when that infection is still active, you can really see a huge reduction in the amount of scar tissue that forms. And I think that's very important um, what, with what we do in eye care. And amniotic membranes, lucky for us, they can be shaped and processed to create a biologic contact lens. So you might be thinking, how okay so now we know how amniotic membranes were first used in kind of just wound healing and in surgeries but who the heck thought of it to put in the eyeball like who thought put this placenta in the eyeball so the first ocular indication was in about 1940 following successful treatment of a chemical burn of the of an ocular surface but that wasn't really kind of um 
there wasn't a lot of traction with that. And it wasn't really until the early 1990s where amniotic membranes became an important therapy for ocular conditions. And now, I mean, this there's over 700 peer-reviewed publications for using um, ocular use of amniotic membranes. You can see from this table on the very right, 1946, you know, there's a couple references in peer-reviewed papers, and then it kind of dies off until the 90s. And then we kind of see this resurgence. And, um, and obviously, this ends in 2008. So there's been, you know, at least I would assume a thousand more publications on the topic of using amniotic membranes in, in eye disease. So as we know, inflammation is the hallmark of ocular surface everything. We're always trying to calm down the ocular surface. If we don't get some of these things under control, it can result in, you know, these side effects. So if you've got corneal inflammation, that can result in keratitis. If you've got some conjunctival inflammation, that can result in a pterygium or a pinguecula. If you've got eyelid inflammation, that can result in de demodex or blepharitis. So getting the inflammation under control um, as soon as you can is really, really important. So inflammation is the very first sign that uh, of wound healing, but uncontrolled inflammation leads to the patient is in a lot of pain and discomfort. So if you've got this really inflamed area, no matter where it is on your eye or in, on any part of your body, you can be very uncomfortable. It can be irritated and you're delayed, you're delaying healing. So when you have this out of control inflammation going on, you're postponing the healing process, which will lead to more tissue damage. And specifically like with eye care, you've developed these vision threatening conditions like corneal haze or scarring. So if we can control the inflammation on the ocular surface, the outcomes will theoretically be better for some of these patients. So now I wanna go through some of the differences between dry and wet amniotic membranes. So let's talk about dry amniotic membranes first, which are kind of in that top right photo. So these are all dehydrated in a way that preserves some of the key elements associated with healing. Every single company has their own proprietary process. And you know, if you want more information specifically, reach out to whatever company you're working with and they will tell you exactly how they are uh, dehydrating their products. This uh, tissue is, is very stable at room temperature. And this will last for about four to five years, depending on the manufacturer. So these, if you buy one, it will last for a very long time. There's definitely going to be at least one patient in that period of time that will benefit from something like this that you'll see. So wet amniotic membranes are on the bottom right there. So this is where they clip a piece of amniotic membrane and they put it in between two rings of this clear, flexible material that's made out of... Um, uh, polycarbonate. The, these amniotic membranes are cryopreserved and they need to be stored cold um, and, and they're in a glycerol media to help prevent it from freezing. So you need to store it in like a fridge. If you do that, they will last for three months. And if you store it in the freezer, they will last for one year. And if you buy enough of them from this company, they will give you an industry strength freezer, which will uh, then in that case, it gets really cold and they will last up to two years. Something that I always like to point out is, um, you know, that there, there are a lot of differences between the dry and wet as far as how you have to store them and take care of them. And that's very important for the type of practice you have and and where you're going so for me when i was in my old practices i had to travel a ton to satellite locations that were one and two hours away so you know traveling with a wet amniotic membrane may be what wasn't the best idea uh versus dry you know i can take that in my bag and i can take it everywhere with me and it will last for a really long time so again, every single dry dehydrated amniotic tissue has their own proprietary process and they do it in a way so that they can still retain the proteins, the cytokines, the growth factors, the collagen, things like that. 
So I'm just going to go over a few. There are so many options now, but when I was first starting to use amniotic membranes, there were really only like a couple companies out there. So the first one I had experience with was the Procara, which was the is, is the wet cryopreserved. And then the second one I got involved with was something called AmbioDisc. This is what it looks like in that blue photo. You can see it says I, O, and P. This is important because there's two sides to this membrane. One side is the stroma, and that's the side that you want making contact with the cornea. The other side is the basement membrane. So when you're putting this on the patient's eye, you want this IOP watermark to face you, the practitioner. So you would be putting it on so that you would be able to read the letters if you were looking at them in a slit lamp. This is another one that I have a lot of use with. It's called BioD. So this is another one where you have to pay attention because there's a dull side and a shiny side. And the dull side is the one that needs to be making contact with the cornea and the shiny side should be facing the practitioner. This is a new one. I have not personally used this, but uh, this is this, the sponsor of this, uh, this evening. So I'm excited to learn more about what their product's all about. But something that I think is important about this one is that it has no orientation issues. You can place it with either side facing down. I can't tell you how many times I placed an amniotic membrane upside down and this having an amniotic membrane that it doesn't matter which side you do is going to take a lot of guesswork out of things and also provide like a you know getting rid of that barrier to entry to doctors that are like ah i don't know i don't remember which one is supposed to touch the cornea and which which way is supposed to be facing away so having a product that doesn't really matter which side you you put on the eye and you just do it i think is is awesome this is another product. I don't have any familiarity with it, but it is a new one that I just learned about. So I thought it was important to share with you all. It's something called Accelerize. And what they do is they do something called um, lyophilization. I had to like look that up because I had never heard of this term before. But what happens is apparently this is some sort of process where the water goes into a vacuum and then that turns the ice into a solid uh, or to a vapor without going through the liquid phase. I do not know about this process. I have no idea how it works. I just learned about this uh, today uh, that this even existed, but I thought this was important to share with you guys because this is another new one that's coming to market. And there's lots of these dehydrated products. You may have heard of you know, there's VisiDisc, there's Ophthalogix, there's Aerol, there's like so many different ones. I can't even name them all anymore. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of different options on, on the market. Again, they're all proprietary in the way that they preserve their uh, cytokines and growth factors. So it's good to kind of learn how each of them operates. So let's talk about the pros and cons of dry versus wet amniotic membranes. The dehydrated, I would say one of the biggest benefits is that it's much less expensive than a, a wet amniotic membrane. So, you know, when you're thinking of ROI or if you're a practitioner that's like, you know what, I just want to try one or like I just have one patient that I think that I want to get it for, definitely this is going to be a cheaper option. It's very easy to store. So this stores at, sh at shelf temperature for up to four or five years. So that's a really long time that you can, you know, you could buy this thing today and theoretically keep it on your shelf and use it, uh, you know, within a four or five year period on a patient and not have to worry about storing it properly or it going bad. Um, it has a longer shelf life. So four or five years compared to the, the wet product, which ranges between three months, you know, to a year or two years, depending on how cold you're able to get it. And the dehydrated is, I think, a lot more comfortable for the patient. And I know that there's people out there that are going to say, no, it's not, or the reps or whatever. But I will tell you, and I'm always going to tell you exactly what my experience is as a, as a professional, that Patients complain way less with a dehydrated amniotic membrane 
than uh, cryo preserved. And that's because the ring is so large and it's just a, a, a bigger product. So it, it is more comfortable for the patient for the most part. The pros of the wet amniotic membrane, it might retain more of those innate characteristics of the natural um, you know, structure potentially resulting in better outcomes. I think that makes sense, right? If you're taking an amniotic tissue that when it comes out and it's this, this is the placenta, it is in like a wet state, right? So I think it makes sense scientifically that if you try to keep it in that state um, and keep it as much as you can in that state, it might retain more of those kind of internal growth factors, cytokines, heavy chain hyaluronic acids, things like that. It's cryopreserved, so it's a, it's a very um, great preservation process for this type of tissue. And currently, cryopreserved amniotic membranes are the only tissue that's cleared for wound healing by the FDA. So, if, you know, some people are very particular on things that are FDA approved, um, and patients as well. So if that is something of concern. That might be something as well. Okay, so the cons of the dry are just basically the opposite of what we just said. It might not retain all of the characteristics of the natural amnion. Um, so, some of the products that have been tested only have trace amounts of those heavy chain hyaluronic acids, PTX3 growth factors, some of the things that they're testing. But again, if you talk to some of the different companies, they usually will have data where they show you and they run tests on the, their own products and compare it with some of the natural amnion. And you can see kind of how they compare. And so, yeah, there's definitely uh, companies that have more of these uh, properties as far as keeping some of these innate structures and, and others that don't have as many. And then the cons of the wet shorter shelf life, it is more costly to the practitioner and you have to store it in a fridge or freezer. And that might be um, applicable to you. So if you are traveling a lot or, you know, you don't want to have to rely on storing something in a fridge or freezer, then, you know, that might not be a good option. So there's pros and cons to, to everything. So the risks of amniotic membranes, even though they are really screened for these communicable diseases like HIV and syphilis and all sorts of stuff, uh, they, they, there's always going to be a risk, right? You know, something could slip through the cracks. Something may have not picked up on one test, but then picked up, you know, a year later. Who knows? There's always going to be a risk of that happening. Um, also, Patients that are wearing the dehydrated product, if you're using a bandage contact lens, sometimes if it's too tight, it can cause edema, hypopion, other issues where the eye is like really irritated. This has happened to a couple of my patients where I put on an amniotic membrane and their eye ended up like looking horrible the next day because I think the contact lens got too tight. There's also this study that um, talks about corneal calcifications in amniotic membranes, but I won't go into all of this. This was in the British Journal of Ophthalmology, but it was pretty inconclusive if it was the amniotic membranes that actually caused the corneal calcifications because these patients were on a lot of other things like glaucoma drops. I will say this has never, I've never seen this in my patients, but I thought that since this was uh, published, I should share it with you. Of course, the question is, what's better, wet or dry? There really is no right or wrong answer. It really depends on the practitioner, your practice. You know, maybe you can't afford uh, a high dollar amniotic membrane, or maybe you just want to try something that's a little bit less expensive. Um, the patient, you, know, what, you need to know what their condition being treated is. Maybe that will sway your decision on what you're going to use. And personally, after using like 600 of these, I've had success with both products. And I'm going to show you some case reports to demonstrate that. So just kind of, I want to just see kind of where we're at with um, which patient would likely not benefit from an amniotic membrane. So Jenna, if we can launch the third poll, let's talk about which one is not going to benefit. Is it somebody with active herpes simplex? someone with dry eye disease, someone with a corneal ulcer, someone with a corneal scar from trauma, 
or somebody with unresolved SPK from PRK surgery a few days ago. All right, Jenna, I think that's enough time. Let's see what we got. Yay! Yes, so 58% of you guys are correct. Uh, corneal score from, scar from trauma. The reason that is, is because that eye has already gone through this active process of having some sort of active infection or irritation or damage and inflammation going on the front surface. So once they get to that scarred point, like if you saw a patient today and they have this corneal scar they've had for 20 years, putting an amniotic membrane on them is not going to do anything. It really needs to be something that's like active and happening right now. Okay, so ocular surgeries have played or amniotic membranes have played a huge role in, in ocular surgeries for chemical burns. Um, for stem cell deficiencies, conjunctival surgeries, uh, pterygium surgeries. This is used a ton. The surgeons that I refer to for pterygiums almost always use some sort of amniotic membrane, uh, symblepharon, and even high-risk corneal transplants. So this has had a really huge role in ocular surgery. And now optometrists have been using it in the optometry world. We can use it for patients that have Stevens-Johnson. You know, they have really horrible ocular surfaces. We can use it on patients that have shield ulcers, corneal abrasions. This is a patient of mine who um, came in because she was in a ton of pain. She, What happened is she thought that she had a contact lens in her eye, but she didn't. So she was just scraping her cornea for like 20 minutes trying to get a contact lens out that wasn't in there. Uh, so corneal abrasions, especially large ones like this, I would absolutely put an amniotic membrane on. Uh, corneal ulcers, you know, people that have these active infections definitely can benefit. Corneal burns, filamentary keratitis, I've had some success with. Some patients do well, others it doesn't make a difference. Dry eye is huge. If you manage a lot of dry eye patients, you probably are using amniotic membranes. Um, or if you have a patient that, you have, that has dry eye and they're not responding to like any other drugs that are that you're doing, this is something you might consider. And patients with recurrent corneal erosions, you know, these patients have, uh, they're scared to go to sleep at night because as soon as they wake up in the morning, they don't know if they're going to have, uh, if their cornea is going to be ripped off by their eyelid. You know, these types of patients uh, can definitely benefit. Uh, patients with Salzman's, Herpes is huge. I have tons of herpes patients that have done really well with an amniotic membrane to help speed up the healing process and help minimize some of the scarring that can occur. So I want to talk about bandage lenses versus amniotic membranes. There was a, a study done, and you have to keep in mind, this was sponsored by Biotissue, who creates Procara, which is the cryopreserved membrane. So you always have to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, this was published in Review of Ophthalmology. But the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I think this, this correlates to what I personally see in practice. So there was a doctor that did a study, and he had patients that got... Um, uh, a superficial keratectomy on both eyes, and he put a bandage lens in one eye, and he put the Procara Slim, so the, the cryopreserved in the other eye, and compared the healing process of, of each eyeball. As you can see from this table, the black bars, those are the people that got the Procara Slim, the number of eyes that were 100% re-epithelialized um, was there was already one eyeball that re-epithelialized by day three. Um, there were seven by day five and eight by day seven. And you can compare it to the bandage contact lens in gray, 
which is kind of slower to respond as far as epithelializing. And again, that is one of the major benefits of amniotic membranes is it helps to promote those epithelial cells to grow and form together and it expedites that healing process. This other chart is showing you how many eyes were completely clear of corneal haze. So within one week, nine out of the 10 eyes in the Procara Slim uh, had complete uh, clarity. And there was no corneal haze. Don't ask about day 30. I don't know what happened to that one eyeball, but eight out of the 10 eyes were still completely clear. But as you can see from this chart, none of the bandage contact lens patients were completely clear of corneal haze after 30 days. Again, you always have to take this with a grain of salt because this is a like a sponsored post uh, or study. But the reason I'm showing this to you is because I think this heavily correlates with my own personal experience of patients that I've seen and treated with amniotic membranes. So we'll just quickly go through kind of the supplies and insertion process because I want to get to some of the case reports. So for a dry, you really only need a bandage lens, which almost all of you guys probably have in your office. You need a dehydrated amniotic membrane. They can, you, all of these companies have them in different diameters and sizes and shapes. I like to use a little pledge it to kind of press those two together and just some saline in case I need it. And all you have to do is insert it like a bandage contact lens. You can also use a lid speculum. I don't do this because patients get freaked out by the speculum. So I don't do it if I, unless I have to, but that is also an option. For the wet amniotic tissue, you're going to need gloves, sterile saline, because you have to rinse all of that glycerol off of that um, membrane. You're going to need numbing drops so that the insertion process is easier. And then some eye patching materials if you are going to patch the eye. In this case, you're just going to insert the Procara or the um, cryopreserved membrane under the upper lid first and then the lower lid. So this is a video kind of showing how to prepare a dehydrated product. So here I just have a bandage contact lens. In this case, it's just a night and day. And just placing that on um, the dental bib here. And now I'm taking out the amniotic tissue. This one has a shiny side and a dull side. So I'm putting the shiny side down because I want the dull side to make contact with the cornea. And then I'm just using a little pledget to kind of push the you know, materials together so that it just kind of forms one thing. And that way I can just insert that really easily onto the patient's cornea. And then I just put it on my finger like a regular contact lens. And then that just goes right onto the patient's eye. The other option is using a lid speculum where you can put the dehydrated product on. Highly recommend following up with a bandage lens because if you just put the membrane on and then you take the speculum out, it kind of just, it does not stay on the cornea and it just like turns into like a little booger. Like that's what I describe it as. Is it like, it just kind of bunches up and because it's, dehydrated, there's like barely any volume to it. So it just kind of like crinkles up and goes into like the fornix. Okay. So then after insertion, um, it's up to the practitioner on what eye drops to use. M me personally, I would just keep them on, on the same eye drop schedule that as if they were not using an amniotic membrane. So let's say it was somebody that had an ulcer. I would absolutely be making sure that they were still taking their antibiotic drops as directed. And amniotic membranes can actually be a very good drug delivery device. So just keep that in the back of your mind as well, because it keeps that medication um, in contact with the ocular surface for longer. And then you're going to see the patient back for follow-ups according to the pathology. If you have a dry eye patient, you might see them back, you know, five days later or a week later versus a severe corneal burn. You're going to need to see that patient every single day. And you will probably have to replace the amniotic membrane every single day. So the more severe the ocular surface issue going on, the faster the amniotic membrane is going to dissolve. So in some cases, you're going to have to use multiple to get to the end result. 
Uh, removing the dehydrated, all you have to do is take it out just like you would but with a bandage contact lens. Um, for a wet, you're going to numb their eye first, and then you just get blunt tip forceps, not the jeweler's ones. You have to get blunt tip, and you just basically have the patient look up, grab that circle, and you just pull down and out. So the proper code for amniotic membranes is 65778. It is a zero day global period. What that means is if you put it on one eye, you'll get reimbursed. If you put it on two eyes, the second eye is gonna get reimbursed at around 50%. So just keep that in mind if, you, if you're doing it on both eyes. Zero day global period also means if that patient comes in again tomorrow and they need another amniotic membrane, you can build this code again. And I have had patients where somebody has needed an amniotic membrane and I have built this code, you know, seven days in a row or 10 days in a row because of how severe their ocular condition is. How much is the cost of the membrane? To you as the eye doctor, it ranges from $100 to $1,000 per device and really just depends on what you're using. The dehydrated products are going to be less expensive than the cryopreserved. And if you buy in bulk, usually we'll get a discount. So for me, I was buying these things like 50 at a time. So I got a really good price because I was buying so many of them all at once. So if you buy, let's say, instead of one, maybe you're buying three, maybe you're buying six at a time that you're going to get a better price. So, you know, do some negotiation with your sales rep. And I know we don't have that much time, so I'll just quickly go through some of these um, case reports that I love. So I had a patient, 55-year-old white female, came in because she said she had a white spot on her left eye that she saw two days ago. She's got a watery eye, photophobia, redness. Uh, she wears AccuView 2 lenses, and she sometimes sleeps in them. So here's what I saw. And... Of course, like any of you, whenever you see something like this, some ulcer or abrasion or whatever it's going on, I always you always have to be so careful and start treatment immediately because this is at in the very center of her eye. So if this thing scars down, it's she's going to have you know issues with her vision. Um, you, that you can see that uh, there's microcystic edema surrounding the border of this ulcer or abrasion or whatever this is. So we're just going to call it an ulcer or abrasion, and we're going to treat it with fortified tobramycin every hour and Vigamox every hour. Whenever I have patients that the ulcer is, you know, a bit scary, I don't know what's going on, I use these two combos, and this has saved many, many eyeballs, especially in a rural area where they don't have access to a corneal specialist or other things. So we tried something called the AmbioDisc, which is a dehydrated uh, product. She came in basically every day and her um, ulcer kept decreasing in size. And after two weeks, there is significant improvement. So we can compare what she came in with using her eye drops plus the amni amniotic membrane looks a lot better. Uh, here's a patient. I think he had an ectropion, and, which was causing abrasion and ended up uh, putting an amniotic membrane on, you can see his cornea is nice and clear. Here's a patient that's got severe dry eye with RK. She's on a million eye drops, but her eyeball still looks like this. Um, we put on a amniotic membrane and a week later, she looks a lot better. Keep in mind, this patient has severe dry eye, so it's not going to be a, a cure-all for everything. She has to come in and get amniotic membranes all the time when, when she has kind of a flare up. And then she's recently since then fit, fitted to scleral lenses, which helps alleviate some of her dry eye. This is one of my favorite cases, a patient that had a uh, LASIK and he just woke up one day and he had this like horrible pain. And, you know, I think he just maybe had some loose basement membrane going on. And you can see the power of amniotic membranes. This is one I had to do many different amniotic membranes, but after about a month, things got down to uh, pretty decent and reasonable where we could treat him more traditionally. And I'm gonna skip this, but I do wanna just show a couple um, photos. 
This is a patient with herpes uh, that has active herpes simplex. And after one week of using an amniotic membrane, you can see the cornea looks a lot smoother and happier. And this is probably one of my favorite photos of all time. This patient had like the central corneal ulcer with this microcystic edema. And if I, I, I can guarantee you, if I just treated this patient with antibiotics, this would have left a scar. And if I tried to treat it with steroids afterwards, there's still going to be some haze. I guarantee that would happen. But if you look at the bottom photo, because we use an amniotic membrane on this patient, there's like no scar. I mean, Dr. Kramer, you can let me know if you see something that I'm not seeing. But I mean, to me, that is like a remarkable improvement. So these are just amazing, amazing cases, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this like these case reports are just like so cool.